sip. Welcome to Tales Tomorrow. I'm Maro, your storyteller for today. With me, I have some more RPG horror stories. Apologies if I sound a little bit different or a little bit off. I think I might be getting a little bit sick. I'm not fully sure. I started feeling a little bit under the weather. Uh, so if I do sound a little bit off, my apologies ahead of time. Without further ado, let's get some RPG horror stories for today. My DM told me a false age and nearly kissed me. I was listening to D&D horror stories on YouTube and I was thinking about sharing my own because it really helped me talk about it often. English isn't my native language, so sorry if I mess something up. And sorry when something is unclear. I've often struggled to remember traumatic things. A short version is on the end. I play different systems since I was 16 and the moment I play with wonderful groups. Both helped me much to heal from this experience. I was looking in 2023, I was 20, for something new. I really love DSA and D&D, but I wanted to try something in other settings. I got into a Shadowrun campaign. Please don't ask me why I stayed that long, I don't know it myself. DM and I had an interview, he told me he was 27. The interview was nice. I talked much and he listened. A few days later at my exams, he wrote me good luck. So at the start, I really look forward to playing with these people. I don't remember my class, but her daytime job was journalist. There was four other players. First was Dwarf One and a chill dad. Second one never showed up again and ghosted DM. Third, new player with me, don't want to play with us after session one. Four, cat, new player after a few sessions, a girl too, and DM don't really care about her. In the session, everything was fine. He showed me a little favoritism, but not so bad. He asked me after two sessions about how he wanted to do something outside the game. I never saw it as a date. We go out for a burger place and we just talk. He didn't want me to pay for myself and I didn't want to argue. In the session, Kat joined us. She introduced herself with her age. DM introduced himself too, cause Chill Dad did her interview. The weird thing was, he was 35 years now. The DM is lying about his age, I guess? Which is a really weird thing to do. Or maybe the DM is just a chameleon that changes their age depending on who they're talking to. Talking to a woman, or oh, I'm younger, talking to a guy, or I'm older, talking to, I don't know, a tiefling. Oh, I'm 174. Nice to meet you, Mr. Tiefling. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's a really weird start to the story. Another weird thing was that he really copied my interest. For example, he started drawing and played a Switch just to talk about Zelda with me. He didn't like it at the end, because open world wasn't something for him. He likes games like Anno. I wasn't any more so uncomfortable with him and he wanted to still hang out with me really badly. Said a second time, yes, because it was annoying and I wanted to tell him that I'm out because of family problems and that I'm together with my ex again. That's a lie, but I and ex think it would be a good idea. So there's no time anymore for Shadowrun. That time I make sure I paid too, by the way, and I talked about how my ex-boyfriend and how happy we are together. And I did ask a few questions about his age. I didn't know the real one, but he told me that he never wanted to tell me how old he is. He told me too that he really likes He told me too that he really likes incels as players so that he look like the better man for female players. He likes incels as players so he looks like the better man for female players players. Does it say he wants to look like an incel or doesn't want to look like an incel? Is that why he hit his age because they thought he would look, make him look like an incel being a 35? I don't understand. Something about incels and looking better for female players. That's all we understood so far. That's all I can gather from this. Hi, editor Mario back because apparently recording Mario does not have any reading comprehension. Or maybe it's because I was sick. I'm not fully sure. Anyway, after reading this part of the story, I believe what they're trying to say is the DM fills their game with a bunch of incel players so that among the crowd of incel dudes they themselves look like the better person at least that's what i think it is basically a pack with a bunch of incels to make himself look good though using that as a strategy in order to attract female players more to himself rather than to the incel players is just i don't know it just sounds really weird this gm sounds like they're trying extremely hard with various different strategies you know you make it kind of worse for yourself whenever you use deception tactics or cheesy little tactics in order to try to attract somebody and especially if over ttrpgs like i get it some people probably find some sort of closure and potentially a romantic partner through ttrpgs but at the end of the day ttrpgs simply are just not 
games for dating. If you want to go date, there's apps for that. There's even things like mixers that people can go to in order to try to find a date. Hell, you could probably go to a bar if you really want to try to find some sort of a date or somebody that you may be attracted to. And while I do understand some people could try to use the social aspect of TTRPGs to expand those social circles and potentially make some friends or maybe find people to date within the TTRPGs, TTRPGs by themselves as they are, are not games to try to find a date. They are to play TTRPGs. Anyway, back to the story. After dinner, I want to drop the topic that I'll quit playing. I had no chance because he put his hands down on my face and came closer. I was weirded out and took a step back. He tried it again and asked me if I'm comfortable. I really wasn't. Thank God other people showed up and he decided to go. I didn't block him because I forgot. <laughs> you didn't block him. After he did that, after you tried to reach towards your face and pull you in for whatever he was about to do, you decided, no, let's not block him. Let's wait to see what happens. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you do that to yourself? If they do something really weird and uncomfortable, block him. Just be done with it. Just be over with it. Because I forgot, and I wanted a really bad a shower, listening to another love and sleeping in the blankets of my ex. We have a little strange ex relationship, because he is my safe comfort. On the next day, DM asked me if he can call. I told him no, because I have to drive four hours for birthday. He didn't take that for an answer. He knows I wasn't lying, because the birthday was something I told him about. He writes me later that day that he's really sad and had the feelings only I can make him happy, and how pretty I am. He never said sorry for anything. I and a girl, I don't know her, but she was there on the birthday party, wrote him a long no back. I'm really appreciative of her, and that she helped a friend of a friend out. I blocked DM after that. I told Kat, the other female player, a short version of what happened, and she was leaving too. It definitely sounds like a really weird creep behavior for the DM to do that. First, lying about his age. First of all, yeah, pay for your meals no matter what, because the last thing you want to do is be in a situation where suddenly you have to owe the DM or really anybody for the meal and stuff. If it's like a really, really good friend and like, nah, I gotcha, it's my treat and covering you, right? That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But if it's somebody that you just recently met and they're like your DM, you don't really know them that well, you just play games with them, that's a little bit weird thing to do. I don't let strangers pay for my meals, but I also don't pay for strangers' meals. If it's a loved one or if it's somebody that I'm with that I know really, really well, then I may offer. But at the end of the day, this is kind of weird. No, don't, don't put yourself in that situation because afterwards it's going to be like, oh, you owe me and stuff. No, don't do that. Don't put yourself in that position. And second of all, don't just grab people's faces and pull them in closer. Also, what do you expect from me to do? I'm not gonna kiss you. Yeah, that's not what you're getting. You're getting a video, but that's about it. We're not at that stage yet. Get to know me more, and maybe I'll give you a little smooch. Anyway, moral of the story, uh, don't be this weird, creepy DM. Kind of borderline insult behavior. Uh, definitely a creep behavior, that's for sure. Let's get to the next story for today. An incomplete list of things one DM did to our party. In the last session of a four-year campaign, one of the PCs was dominated by the BBEG with a command to help him in every way she, a bard, could. Players took a deep breath, apologized profusely, and well, he went haywire. He ended up very almost killing our cleric and Magus, and all the while the DM was half laughing and half worrying, and us players were lovingly insulting each other. You managed to save the day and our bard, and then suddenly one of us said, well if you were an excess campaign, you'd be gone for good. This comment made us remember a previous campaign we sort of all played in at some point or another, and we ended up parting ways with that DM. At the time, we thought it was because there were unmendable differences in what we wanted as players and what the game he wanted to run as a DM. After becoming DMs ourselves, we learned that was not the case. So here's a probably incomplete as there is missing player and we did this in memory after years list of things we took as lessons or what never ever to do to our players over the course of a campaign. We got a pretty big list over here, so buckle in y'all. It's gotta be nice and juicy. Fighter with low wisdom accepts a gift from another player's character. A seed that he claimed would heal her wounds. A character was passing as cleric or druid was really a lawful evil warlock. Congratulations, Fighter, you are now cursed. You'll find out during the course of the campaign that you're basically undead, and the curse will slowly spread with every death saving throw to an unknown result. The DM will never ever give any clues of how to remove this curse except Finding an old woman in a swamp. Fighter finds the body of a young noble on a battlefield against a monster. She takes the insignia from his body and, when in town, goes to that noble house to make sure they're informed of this guy's death and its circumstances. She befriends the other two heirs, brothers, and gets rewarded with a plus one dagger. This will be the only magic item she will ever, ever receive over the course of 10 levels. 
Despite being presented as potential ally, this noble family will also never be mentioned again in the campaign and will be forgotten despite attempts at retconning. They were murdered off screen with no way to finding out. Having only a plus one dagger up to level 10 is wild, dude. <laughs> Your DM really doesn't like you. If you have only one karate plus one dagger as your only magic item throughout the entirety up to level 10, that is wild. <laughs> Jesus Christ. The dude wakes up in the middle of the night seeing a nightmarish creature stealing the souls of the party. Creature agrees not to do it if the druid will agree to do a favor. Armed with the hopes and dreams of level 3 characters, the druid accepts under duress. This ends up costing the party access to a major town, cutting off every single quest we were going there and forcing us to flee in the middle of the night. Barbarian gets petrified during a fight. With no way of freeing him of the moment, the player decides to temporarily change character and, when they manage to unpetrify his old one, the DM demands he stays at the same level he was. DM also rules that every character change mid-campaign will have a level penalty. Barbarian therefore stays two more levels behind the party's progression for the entire campaign. Edit. Warlock dies a horrible death. When asked if there is anything that can be done for the fight to soul, DM chuckles and describes how the Warlock's soul is eaten as well. Player replies by describing he gets eaten with both his middle fingers raised. Fight and Warlock had become close friends during the campaign and Warlock felt deeply sorry for having deceived her. With him, they only hope to know more about the curse dies too. Whoa, you can't break the curse now. Nobody knows how to break the curse. Whoa, permanent curse now. Stuck on you forever. Wee, so fun. It's it's really not that fun. Anyway, let's continue. Fighter B joins the party. He's actively working against them. He's a spy for the BBEG. The DM makes sure this is undiscoverable and forges situations and ways this character stays beyond any suspicion. Fighter manages to befriend him. See a pattern there? and he decides he's on the wrong side of the war. The very same moment he does this, the DM outs him as a spy. He loses every single contact and every single resource he previously had, and the entire party is now declared killable on sight if they set foot inside a major settlement. He will have no way to recover anything, and the player decides to abandon the campaign. Having a character that is working as a BBAG is a very slippery slope when it comes to setting up the whole plot. It can work, it could definitely work, and I've seen it work before in previous stories, previous glory stories that people have shared. But at the end of the day, the DM and the player have to be on board with it, but also the other players, it, it can just make it so malicious and toxic to the point where another player just screwing over the party and the DM just constantly covers for them, and suddenly when it just, you know, breaks and stuff and they become friends, suddenly you don't have any of that. I don't know, man, it just becomes, it becomes such a sour experience. Yeah, now you decide to become friends with another fighter. Oh no, look, because because you did that, now you don't have any more of the control and you're killed on site and I have all these penalties and stuff. It's just probably best not to deal with it. If you're gonna have one player work with the BBEG, you might as well have the entire party work with the BBEG. Have the entire party make a contract or be forced into a contract or whatever or what have you. Maybe the campaign starts as the minions for BBEG or they work under him. They're like maybe, you know, generals for the BBG or something, I don't know. Only major settlements have a remote, rollable of course, chance of magic items or ways to progress the main story. Similar settlements are plagued by war and famine and will not share food or resources with the party, sometimes being unwilling to take them because they're good. So the party is forced to rely on the druid to forge for food. Druid starts to feel his connection to nature falter. Druids were ruled to function as clerics due to setting reasons. The moment the party steps foot in the forest, Druid starts to be plagued by visions of his patron god being heard. The fighter's greatsword, a family heirloom that represents her only proof of being a noble family's heir and who claims her title, breaks. As they have no access to settlements, the party manages to find a hermit blacksmith deep in the mountains through meeting his son. His kind, dumb as a rock, and the young fighter falls in love. The party is smitten with the situation and the NPC, and for a couple of sessions, they find peace and quiet as the smith's guests. An NPC intervenes on the third session, revealing they have just compromised the secret emperor's son identity. The smith's son gets taken away. He'll promise the fighter that upon the next meeting, he will have an armor for her to protect her against anything. They will never meet again. A traveling merchant appears, party has gained a maximum of 50 gold pieces during the whole campaign. <laughs> His prices for magic items start at a thousand, but he accepts alternative payment of course. The fighter sacrifices some of her blood so the druid can at least have a magic staff. It ends up being a staff with a detachable owl that functions as fine familiar. We sigh, but we now have a way to scout ahead. Keep the owl in mind, because it will save the party from a TPK. 
The traveling merchant was chaotic evil. The fighter's blood, he sold it to BBEG. An evil clone of the lawful good fighter starts wreaking havoc without us knowing, further cutting us from settlement or potential allies. NPCs will befriend and start being killed off screen. There's nothing worse than just having a bunch of your NPC allies just be killed off screen just because the DM is plotting some sadistic ploy. Another good lesson, if somebody asks you to pay in blood, don't do it. Just don't. Just simply don't. Clearly they want your blood for something, and whatever they got scheming, just don't offer it. i rather offer my pinky instead of blood. Actually no, don't even offer pinky. Don't offer any flesh or blood of yourself. Just whatsoever. The one little bone, little bit of cartilage from your ear. No, just don't let him have it. Little bit shaving from the horn. Uh-uh. A little bit of eyelash fell out of the eye. Nope, don't even give him that. Don't give him any parts or any bodily stuff whatsoever. Just don't trust if somebody wants to buy stuff with blood. With his warlock dead, the player makes an archer ranger looking for his family. He'll find his family dead in a cage three sessions later, during a dungeon that will last six months in real life. At the start of the same dungeon, DM rules for crippling wounds. Ranger gets a shoulder broken and will roll attack with disadvantage during the whole dungeon. The only thing that can cure crippling wounds is a restoration, which is not accessible to anyone of the party. Okay, do not maim your players and force them to have restoration available. Allow them to use a healing kit to maybe, I don't know, fix themselves up or cure wounds or lesser restoration or something. The dude has been looking for ways to help his god, who he knows is trapped in mortal form. He'll find him, sure. Got it on altar with the DM claiming we took too long to find him. Druid angrily changes to cleric, isn't of high enough level to learn restoration anyway, doesn't regain spells because he hasn't managed to do a long rest. Just before entering the dungeon, we also meet the bard, unconscious. The bard was robbed of his instrument and has no way of performing without it. We'll find it three sessions later, half of the enemies in the dungeon are declared under a sort of frenzy that makes them immune to charms and mind effects making her spells useless. The party will also never set foot in a settlement where the bard's background or abilities can be used, prompting her to soon multi-class warlock to feel slightly useful, or basically only Eldritch Blast for the rest of the campaign. The whole dungeon forbids long rest due to time constraints and enemies constantly ambushing us. We arrive at the final boss fight with a single cure wound spell, no more resources and two spells. We are too late for whatever is happening there. The NPC is trapped in the cage and will have no way to give her the key to free herself. The DM declares we have three turns before the cave collapses. On a second turn, Fadi gives the key to the cleric's Al Familiar. Remember the staff she paid so dearly for? It directs it to fly and give it to the NPC. The NPC manages to roll under the 25% chance to stop the gunpowder from exploding. The DM is silent for several minutes after that, letting the combat run its course while we cheer and hype ourselves up for last turn. On the cleric's last turn, he remembers he had an item given to him as a reward for a side quest. It's Saber Suck Petrification. He decides to give it a try, and beating the old odds, the DM rolls a 1 on the saving throw. The bad guy petrifies and doesn't finish the incantation. The ceiling can't collapse now too, and the DM ends the session visibly pissed off. He later revealed to a player we had thwarted a story TPK he was planning for months. God, that is so malicious. Do not plan a story TPK for players. That is the worst thing to do. That is such DM versus player mentality. Don't plan for a TPK. Don't set up a TPK. If a TPK happens, it happens. But don't set up a TPK. It's fine to put in stakes. It's fine to put in some dangerous moments. It's fine to put in some little timers here and there for a session. But don't plan for a TPK. There's nothing more malicious than planning for a TPK because that to me as a player tells me that you don't care for my player character. You don't care that my player character is alive. You don't care for any chance of my player character surviving. You're planning for us all to die. And therefore, what's the point of me planning to even attend the next session at that point? If your plan is to kill us off, then why should I plan to make it for the next scheduled session then? What's the point? Traveling Merchant appears again. We cannot purchase a single item from his store, haven't gained very little from the dungeon itself except trauma, which isn't a good currency, and choose something to disguise one of the characters so we can find out what's happening in the cities we can't enter. That item will be revealed to be cursed and steal memories from whoever is wearing it. Party still unaware the merchant is chaotic evil. Party needs to reach a big city to somewhat progress with the story, but it's on the other side of the continent. The only way to do that is to purchase a flying rug which is priced at 10k with no way to afford it. Party accepts a side quest. During the side quest, the DM cuts off the rogue, the ranger's new character's arm as a result of a 1 on a saving throw. Player abandons the campaign shortly after. 
edit. This was done without the player's consent, but it was around the time when Sekiro came out, so you got a mechanical arm replacement. If you want to do a mechanical arm replacement, like if you want to do some sort of a prosthetic from Sekiro, ask your player. Don't just assume that everybody would be down for it and be like, Ooh, I'm gonna cut off someone's arm. Rogue! Bam! Your arm is cut off. But hey, I heard of this game called Sekiro, and they have a prosthetic in the game and everything. If somebody wants a prosthetic, or if you want to talk to the players, be like, Hey, so I heard of Sekiro. I think prosthetics would be a cool item to have. And just maybe offer them up as an option from a non-chaotic evil merchant or something. I don't know. I know that Ryoko's Guide to Yokai Realms has prosthetics and they're cool and all. They look pretty neat. But like at the end of the day, don't force your players to have a prosthetic by just chopping their arms or legs off and stuff. Ask him and they'll be down for that. Maybe they can actively like have them attached or like purchase them and stuff without having some sort of traumatic reason. Oh, you went in a dungeon, your arm is off. Oh, that sucks. But hey, there's a prosthetic on sale now. <laughs> the side quest has no ties to the story and is set in a world we are unfamiliar with. There are likely no clues on what needs to be done. The party doesn't speak the world's language and likely misinterpreted a clue due to mistranslation. With no help from the DM side whatsoever. This leads to what seems like a very likely doom. At our wit's end, the players take over an entire session to explain everything what's wrong and how helpless and incompetent we're feeling. None of the players' quests have progressed, some got entirely erased. We feel the main story isn't progressing and everything and everyone is running against us. We're now level 8 and have no magic items except a couple of cursed ones and a plus one dagger and some low level house ruled knickknacks that don't do much. The spin-off with well-built and well-equipped characters which is meant to progress some of the story ends up highlighting how useless to the story the previous party has been. Edit. One of the players just reminded me this new party wasn't even responsible for saving the city per se. We had to free an ancient evil spirit, again good party, who took care of the other evil spirit, the one that was about to eat the character's soul at the beginning, remember? because he had a grudge against it. During the final battle where both the old party and new party are fighting the BBAG morphed into a flying dragon, the barbarian slips and plummets down from the sky. There's no way to save him and in desperate attempt to help his allies one last time, the barbarian accepts an evil destiny he has been fighting against for all the campaign, becomes a monster, fails his attacks, keeps falling, during the finale, Barbarian's character is nowhere to be found, the player quietly witnesses. Imagine playing throughout the entire game and suddenly, oh, Barbarian, you slipped and fell and gone forever. That would be the worst. Right the finale too. Clara declares he is not interested in any leading position in the church, preferring to spend the rest of his life with the Bard. The DM announces him the head of the church anyway. Oh, great. Fighter, now Paladin, learns there's no cure for her curse. Considering how far the curse has progressed and the campaign is now ended, her ultimate goal is to reclaim her father's title and the city she was born in is now unattainable. She's also now a ticking time bomb that the Warlock's patron can take over and her evil clone is still around. Plus the Barbarian is a monster now and she wishes to find him. Her crippled mother, who she just learned is alive despite having almost burned to death and having secretly led the resistance until now, is in no condition to travel with her, despite wanting to be at her side. Paladin declares the other party's bard a lawful good childhood friend, the new town's protector and leaves. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the giant list of things not to do. Or this one DM did to this party that just not to do. There's a lot of learning material. I'm not even gonna cover it. Like. All of it is just there. Go read the list again. <coughs> <coughs> My throat is really dry, so I'm just gonna end the video here and I'm gonna get water off screen. Out tomorrow! Roll the outro! And with that, that's gonna be all our stories for today. I wanna thank you very much for watching and thank you so much for being here. If you like what I do, consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like. Also, if the RPG horror stories ever goes down or if you wanna submit your own personalized horror story, email is down in the description below. I'll see you again in more Tales tomorrow. Bye-bye.